Amen. Thank you for that powerful special music. And it was spot on with today's message. I love this season. I love this season because on this season we always can hear the word Jesus Christ and people don't quite cringe. We hear all the facts about Jesus and we assume them to be true. Today we're going to have a a unique message. It's going to talk about Christ, always Christ-centered, always Bible-based, and always Holy Spirit-led. But today we're going to do an inventory of this story, and we'll go beyond it at two. The title of the sermon is called The Presence of Christ, and you probably know I had a pun in words. It's also the presence of Christ. Amen? Before we begin, let us go ahead and say a quick word of prayer. Lord, you're the only person that can shed light in this world. Humans on their own can produce no light. So, Lord, after, after we seek after life, which is the light that you share to us, Lord, may you shine through me. May this flawed lens not get in the way of your glory. Allow your message to be proclaimed. Allow hearts to be changed. Allow us to draw closer to you in this message and be with each person here. Lord, comfort those who mourn and put your arm around those who need peace. Calm our minds for those who are anxious and give strength to those of us who need it in our weakness. Lay your healing hands upon us to those who are sick. And Lord, keep us company for those who are lonely. Be with us in this holiday season, more now than ever, Lord. May we make that choice for you today. We ask in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. May his children say, Amen. Amen. Now, I am no botanist by any stretch of the imagination. But this plant was, was given to me and my wife, and uh, when we first got it, we boiled it because we left it in the car in the sun as a little seed, and so it looked somewhat like stir-fry. After that, I uh, I don't think it was quite dead yet, but it was very close, and then we put it out in the open sun. Apparently, this is a house plant. And so full on Texas sun at 120 degrees and the brink of day, took that boiled plant and sauteed it. But I like to nurture things. I'm not sure how to take care of a plant very well. But I put it in some nice soil. I would always put my finger in there and aerate it a little bit. And when I saw it was thirsty, I'd feed it some water. And once it was nice and taken care of, I'd put it in a nice place where there was just enough sun for it, but it was still cool enough to live. You see, this plant is not a winter plant either. But I gotta say, from its destroyed little seed and from its cooked little roots, a little tender love and mercy will go a very long way. And that's just a plant. If you don't nurture a plant, it will either be weak, you know, wilty, not produce a seed, not produce fruit. But if you take care of it, well, that little guy is doing pretty good for his, himself. I haven't given him a name yet. I'm pretty sure I will after today. But today we're going to be talking about the seeds of salvation. Actually, we're going to talk about the seed of salvation. Amen? 
The seed of salvation is a seed that God himself planted into this world. He did to give life to humanity. And humanity needed, needed that seed more than anything. You see, what happened was the world began practicing evil. And we're talking about the days of Jesus now when he was coming to the earth. Evil and corrupt deeds became casual, usual, and acceptable. Mercy. Mercy? Much like today, right? And in that dark, sin, confused, embedded world, the children of God were lost. In fact, they were almost ployed to go ahead and join along in all those worldly games. But that's not what God had intended. But the need for a Messiah became needed far beyond and far before that day. In fact, in the Garden of Eden is when we first needed that Savior. And so we go back to the very beginning in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. The Word of God says, I will put an enmity between you and a woman, between your seed and her seed. Because Adam and Eve met the father of lies in the Garden of Eden. They succumbed to temptation and disobedience. They ate from the one tree. I know, some kids are like, why did he put the one tree in the garden then? For obedience. They ate from the one tree that contained sin. Disobedience. By eating of it by itself was the sin. All the other trees in the garden were good, right? But this one tree was bad. Besides referring to the seed as this enmity, enmity is a special word. It means stress. It means friction. Have you ever had tension in a room, like right before an argument would break out, and you knew there was tension in that room? That's the enmity that was being spoken of here. But it also refers to the manner of how evil hates good and how good desires to try to save evil. That's the enmity that's being spoken of in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. But God also gave the location that the seed would be planted. He said that uh, it's going to be found in Micah chapter 5, verse 2. But you, what? Bethlehem, right? And some versions it also uses the subtext, Ephratha. Bethlehem means bread. Ephratha means fruitful. Though you are little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of you shall come forth to me the one to be ruler in Israel. And if we go to the next verse, which is now on the PowerPoint, who is going forth from old, from or for everlasting or for eternity. So this can mean only one person because a ruler is not going to rule eternally unless he's something besides a human. He has to be a God. Amen. Absolutely referring to the Son of Man. God would also give his title. He would say in Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6, For unto us a child is born, right? For unto us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulders, and his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, and Prince of Peace. In Isaiah 7, 14, it says, Behold, the virgin shall, what? Conceive. You know, when the Pharisees were saying, Give us a sign 
Do you know that God could have said, I did? Do they know these scriptures? They knew. They had to memorize these scriptures by the time they were 12 or 13. They knew the scriptures, especially the book of Isaiah. This is one of their most favorite books. It's a beautiful book of the Old Testament. And we're staying pretty much today in the Old Testament. Amen? I want to use what they used. I might go once or twice in the New Testament, but not often. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel, meaning God with us. Praise God. Because it says given. Do you know what the word given means? It doesn't mean taken back. When you give something, you give it. When God put on flesh for humanity, guess what? He kept it. He gave up his divinity as a omnipresent person and put on human flesh and became 100% human and 100% divine. Divinity wrapped in humanity. That's another sermon. God was so bold. Let me go past this one because I just covered it. God was so bold that he also gave the exact time. Now, why would he give the exact time? In Daniel 9.25... He says, know therefore and understand, right? That going forth from the decree to rebuild Jerusalem and the temple, both in, in one, to restore and build Jerusalem until what? Messiah the Prince. There will be seven weeks and 62 weeks. Now that's 69 weeks. There's also a whole list of things that goes on that they need, they need to do within that 69 weeks. And it will be nearly impossible. And so we know because we do our theology, we know because we do line upon line and precept upon precept, we're using a day equals a year principle in this. So a week would equal not seven days, but seven years. Amen? All right. So with that being said... How many days are in 69 weeks? And that's really hard to say, 7 times 69. Let's round up one week. What's 7 times 70? 490. Let's minus 7 days now, or 7 years. How many is that? 483 years. There's my mathematicians. That's what I'm talking about. So we have a timeline. Anti-Xerxes made a decree in 457 B.C., if we fast forward and go 483 years, we're going to come to the year 27 AD, and this is the year that Jesus was baptized. Again, the scripture says, Messiah the Prince. Messiah means anointed. And at the baptism of Jesus Christ, he was anointed by the Holy Spirit. John himself says, Behold. I saw it not just go upon him, I saw it stay with him. He kept the Holy Spirit with him, amen? So, we have the who, what, when, where, and how. And that's some big stuff. That's all from Old Testament. We haven't gone nowhere in New Testament yet, right? But the question is why? Why did he come? What was his purpose? And that's the biggest thing. If he's making a big ruckus about coming down... And he gives prophecy after prophecy, I'm coming, I'm coming, I will be there, I will be there on time, I'll be there in the right manner, I have the appointment, I will meet it. Why? Well, see, after his baptism, he began his, his ministry. And the issue was, is Isaiah was really aware of this, even back in his day, he says that the world had become dark. It was so dark that he would lament and write all this awesome scripture. He says, the people who walked in darkness have seen 
a great light. Those who dwell in the land of the shadow of death, upon them a light has shined. It almost seemed as if evil has won. It almost seemed like the, 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 the night was going to swallow up the day and there'd be no chance that the Messiah would ever make his presence. Right on time, the same, the same year, the same manner, the same gender, through a virgin, through the impossible, God kept his appointment, right? And that's just, that's just trying to get to the point of saying, besides an, a, a wonderful hymnal song, little town of Bethlehem, that we know where these scriptures come from. They're in your bulletin, by the way. I left them on the bottom. All these promises are right there. All these prophecies that came true. Jesus came to illuminate the desolate and darkened earth and to reestablish an authentic connection between God and man. Isaiah again says in Isaiah chapter 61, verses 1 through 3. Let's see if I get a thing to produce it for me. Yes, I can. And this is probably my favorite verse in the whole Bible. The Spirit of the Lord, God, is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to preach good tidings to the poor. Listen carefully. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, the opening of the prison to those who are bound, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord and a day of vengeance of our God to comfort all who mourn and to counsel those who mourn in Zion, to give them beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness, that they may be called trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he may be glorified. There's a lot there. And it's very close to the Beatitudes when Jesus first preached on earth. Very similar. My question for you today is, would you like to be referred to as trees of righteousness? I know I do. I know I would like my life to glorify the Lord. So the time and the place, the location, the manner, the why, all has been answered. Now, all that's left is for humanity to understand. And guess what? They didn't. And that's where we get to the, the, the nativity story. And this is where we get to the story of Christ. Christ. He came down and his own knew him not. Right? If they read the scriptures, if they opened their eyes to the possibility, if they would have saw the Messiah, how much different would his ministry have been? But instead... We have a baby born in a manger in a town of Bethlehem. While everybody else is warm inside their houses, he was born outside. He was born in the most humble of conditions, right? And Mary, before any of this happened, was visited by an angel. Now I want you to catch wind of this real fast because you might not fully understand about Mary. We know she accepted a charge when the angel came to her, right? But do you realize she had to give up all her worldly plans? All the plans she had made had just gone out the window. 
If a woman who is not married has a child, does that bring honor to their family? She was going to accept a possibility. She was going to disgrace mom and dad. That she was going to lose a fiancé. That even possibly she might be stoned in the street because of this offense. Because she was considered an adulteress. You don't, it takes two to tango, they say. Who would believe a virgin birth? She would be the bearer, caretaker, and provider for the one who would bear our sins, care over our situations, and provide life everlasting to those who would believe. And the first person she came in contact with, with was Joseph after she came back from Mary. After she came back from Elizabeth, I do apologize. And when Joseph saw her, how did he feel? Did he believe? He didn't believe. I will put her away as a gentleman. I will excuse her so she won't get stoned, but she needs to leave town, is what he was saying. Then the angel visited him that night, and guess what? Our boy Joseph believed. Together. Together they would nurture a seed that would produce a child. In Hebrews chapter 10, verse 5, the Word of God says, Sacrifice and offering you do not desire, but a body you have prepared for me. And burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin you had no pleasure. Then I said, Behold, I have come. And the volume of the book that is written of me to do your will, O God. What's being said here is, I know that the children of Israel, your children, are sacrificing everything to abide by their sins, and you don't want that. You rather obedience more so than sacrifice. I know that they've been asking for a lot of appeals, but you don't want those requests. You want them to just listen to you. I have come. I will do your will, O oh God. When nobody else will, I will. Now, if he asked me if I could have a child, because I have no child quite yet, but if I could, and you said that child is going to be the son of God, I might think that's a pretty awesome thing to have. I think that would be pretty cool. But unfortunately, the exact opposite. If they knew they had a child of God, do you think mom and dad would research those scriptures a little bit more? Trying to find out details about his prophecies that we'll have to go through? I think mom would definitely want to know what's happening to her little boy. I think she would be concerned. In Isaiah chapter 53, verses 1 through 4, the word of God says, for he shall grow up before as a tender plant. Let's see if I get this to work. There we go. And as a root out of dry ground. He has no form of comeliness, which means majesty. He has no form of honor. In other words, he's humble. All right? He is despised and rejected by man, a man of sorrows and antiquated with Grief. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteem him as being hit, as being stricken, as being smitten by God and afflicted. Question, is that good news for mom? How would Mary have felt? 
Again, we're in the book of Isaiah, one of the most famous books to the Jews. They love this book. It's one of their greatest... If, if, you, look at, if you look inside, when they open up their, 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 their bookcase of scrolls, the book of Isaiah is the one that's huge and made of gold. It's very big. The only one that comes close to Isaiah is the Torah, the first five books of Moses, the books of the law, and those are also gold. But Isaiah stands next to those five books. They knew this book, and Mary knew this scripture. But question, could mom put on a strong face? Moms, mom, can you put on a strong face? When our Savior, when your son faced Pontius Pilate, when he stood before the Praetorium watching a murderer go free, and your son was condemned. Mom, would you be able to hold a strong face while they scourged your boy? When, when your boy put his hands around that cross that he had to drag all the way to Calvary, her mouth never opened an objection. There's no scriptural evidence that she said anything do you know why she knew it was true he wasn't convicted and condemned because of the people he healed he wasn't convicted and condemned for the people he resurrected to life he was convicted and condemned because they said are you the son of God and just like on Mount Horeb, when Moses approached a humble, normal, everyday average burning bush, and he says, I am that I am has sent you. Just as he went to Isaiah to redeem Israel, he says, I am. I am in the beginning, I am in the end, and I am that ever was. So echo through the prophetic words of Jesus Christ when they asked him, Are you the Son of God? And he said, I am. That's, that's what got Jesus crucified. Saying he was the Son of God. And mom did not object. Because mom knew she had evidence. All I know is my mom has put a strong face on before for many of the events of my life. But if she ever thought that I was wrong and I was making a horrible decision, she would speak up. Mary never spoke. In Luke chapter 1, uh, this is New Testament because we have to go here, it's Mary being talked to. In Luke chapter 1, verses 30, 31, 35, the angel is speaking to Mary. And this is what he says. This is while the baby is decidedly going to be born in her womb. The angel says, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God, and behold... You will conceive in your womb and bring forth a son and call his name Jesus. Any questions yet? That's pretty self-explanatory. The Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the highest will overshadow you. Therefore also that Holy One which is to be born will be called the Son of God. Mary knew. Mary knew. And that's why she did not object. That's why she kept her mouth quiet. And that's why she let what had to happen, happen. When she held him as a baby boy, she knew he had to be wounded for our transgressions. She knew he had to be bruised for our inequities that he was to be disciplined for our peace and that he was to be hurt 
so that we could be healed. Now, I'm sorry this is not a cheery Christmas story, but we'll get there in a second. We got to go to the bad news first, right? <laughs> Questions, Mom. How could you prepare your son for this? Because a mom is very protective. A good mom is super protective. Making sure that her children will be taken care of. That they shall not want, right? That if they bruise their knee, if they scrape it, she'll pick up that child and kiss that knee and say, I love you, it's okay. How could you protect your child knowing what was about to happen? And at age 12... An arrow went into her heart when she lost her boy in Jerusalem. And when he was found, and she says, are you okay? What did he say? Do you not know that I must be about my father's It had started. It had begun. Even before he was baptized, he was about his father's business. Mercy. I have a new respect for Mary. I really do. When it was time for Mary, when it was time for a mother to let go. Kind of like when we let our children go to college. It's kind of difficult. But when she had to let go and have faith in God when that day came and he was baptized and he went off, when she had faith to let go, Sorry, let me go back to that. There we go. In Isaiah 53, 7, 8, it says, He was oppressed and he was afflicted. And the jury of Pontius Pilate, he opened his mouth not. Instead, he was led as a lamb to the slaughter. And as a sheep before its shearers is silence, so he opened not his mouth. Mercy. I would complain. But he was about his father's business. He was taken from prison and from judgment. And who will declare his generation? For he was cut off from the land of the living. For the transgression of my people, he was stricken. Now, I want you to pay attention to the very last verse there. God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten son. Again, I'll read this. For the transgressions of my people, he was stricken. Do you understand? And she had to depend on God for faith to keep his promises. Psalm 16, now we get to the good news. We're done in bad news time. All right, now we get to the good news. Psalm 1610, for you will not leave my soul in Sheol. Sheol is the grave, just for those who want to know it's Hebrew. Nor will you allow your Holy One to see corruption. Psalm 4915, but God will redeem my soul from the power of the grave. For he shall receive me, Selah which means peace or the end of that. We are promised this as well, you know. Through Christ, we are promised this as well, that we will be raised from that grave. Incorruptible. Amen? There is even scripture talking about his ascension. In Psalm 68, 18, 19, for you have a sigh, you have led captivity captive, You have received from God gifts of men, even for the rebellious, 
that the Lord God might dwell there. Blessed be the Lord who daily loads us with benefits, the God of our salvation. Now, if you have a New King James Version, the word's going to say, um, from. It's using a lamed. Um, it could be for or from, but what's happening is, in Ephesians chapter 4, I think it's verse 25, no, Ephesians 4.10, it says, and he gave gifts to men. And that's um, one of our most famous Seventh-day Adventists in the Bible, Paul of Tarsus. So he is um, actually scholarly deciphering this Hebrew poem and deciphers in the Lamed as you have received gifts for men. Just so you know, if you're wondering why that is conflict. What gifts? Now this is Christmas. Now we got to the gifts. What gifts did he give men? Salvation is a huge gift, right? Amen. But in Ephesians 4.10, he says they got a few things. He gave some to be apostles. He gave some to be prophets. Some to be evangelists and some to be pastors some teachers. But all these have one thing in common. All these have one thing in common. Do you know what the gift besides salvation, which is the most important one, which gift Jesus gave men when he ascended on high? Holy Spirit, share the gospel, amen. He placed seeds of righteousness within us. And they are surely watered by the Holy Spirit. And they are surely all used to proclaim the word of God. There's no way I'd be up here today without that seed that was planted in my chest so long ago. So question, do you think of these seeds, if they're allowed to grow, would allow some to be teachers, some to be preachers, some to be evangelists? I think so. Matthew chapter 7, verse 18 through 20 says, a good tree. Now, this is where it comes full circle. Jesus Christ wasn't whistling Dixie when he came speaking parables. He means this. A good tree cannot bear bad fruits, nor can a bad tree bear good fruits. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Therefore, by their fruits you shall know them. Now let's go back to the beginning. And you know I'm going to wrap up when I do that. In the Garden of Eden, how many trees had sin in them? One tree. This, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Every other tree was righteous and good. Brothers and sisters, today the devil has worked overtime. All these trees around us are wicked. It's like a polar opposite. There's only one, there's only one tree of true righteousness. Mother of all other righteous trees. This tree, from the original seed, was planted on Calvary. It was down in the ground for three days. All right? And once it sprouted up, perfection, salvation was now available for men because Jesus Christ on his last breath said, it is finished. It is completed. It is done. He knew he finished the race as Pastor Dina was singing today. He knew that he walked a mile that we could not. He died the death that we deserve, that we should get the life that he has. That seed of righteousness came to earth, was planted on Calvary, and sprung up life everlasting for humanity. He has healing in his wings. 
and he freely offers life to all those who would desire. You see, Jesus desires to plant a seed in each one of our hearts today. In Psalm 68, 20, our God is the God of salvation. He's the one that escapes death. No other God can do that. No other person can do that. No other thing can do that. Only our God. I want you to hear my appeal. Like my plant here, and that seed of righteousness in your chest, you might have been burnt, bruised, beaten, left out in a wrong position. You might have been abused, used, and let down, and that seed, you might feel, has no power. I got news for you. It does. You might think that you don't want to see the fruits that the seed has for you. I have news for you. You cannot live without it. You may think that you won't know how to keep it or nurture it. I got news for you. God will walk alongside you and help you every step of the way. It's very difficult for a little seed to push through the soils of our hearts to break through the layers of callousness that we have had. But if you so let God shine in your heart today, if you open a door to his salvation, to his acceptance, and surrender your will to his will, he will produce out of you something truly amazing. And from that one seed of righteousness that was planted in your heart, you will produce 30, 60, or 100 fold if you are left to his tender care. This plant should be dead. I don't think it was the work of my finite hands that caused this to happen. I think as I was touching the soil and as I was caring for it, watering it and trying to take care of it, God came alongside and kind of assisted me on that. But brothers and sisters, let me tell you, that's only a plant. I'm not even sure what species of plant it is. You are children of God. You are his walking, living, breathing testimony. How much more important are you? So I'm not sure if this is the first time you ever heard about a man named Jesus Christ. Or if you know about the Savior I'm referring to, how he came down from heaven to earth, put on human skin, dwelt among us, and died for us. Whatever party we are in, I ask today that you allow God to change the terrain of your hearts, allowing those seeds of righteousness to bloom and produce fruit. I'm not sure how much time we have left, brothers and sisters. But I do know, I do know, that a tree is judged by its fruits. And we can't produce fruits on our own. There's no acting, no work, no thing you can do. All we must do is surrender. Last scripture. Isaiah 61, verse 11. For as the earth brings forth its bud... As the garden causes the things that are sown in it to spring forth, 
so the Lord will cause righteousness and praise to spring forth before all nations. Are you ready to be called trees of righteousness? Let us pray. Lord our Father, I count it all joy because you came from heaven to earth. Lord, you lived a life that we could not live. You had a real mom. You had a real dad. You had brothers and you had problems. You had troubles growing up. And Lord, you maintain saying, I must be about my father's business. You surrendered your life. May we surrender our will. You give up heaven for us. May we give up earth for you. May your plans be above our plans. May your thoughts be above our thoughts. And Lord, when you speak to us, may our ears be opened and inclined to the voice. And may we do according to your will. We ask humbly in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. May his children say, Amen. Amen. God bless you. Happy Sabbath. Merry Christmas.